Thank you, Penny. Um, and thank you um, to the Shakespeare Reloaded team for inviting me to present today. It's an honour to be here and especially in a room of like-minded souls. Um, when Claire asked me what I wanted to speak about, I said, I kind of just want to tell stories. So this might just be a bit of a different keynote, but I'm a playwright, I'm a storyteller, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, the stories I want to share with you are not measurable. Um, they're rarely shared. They don't have tracked outcomes. They, don't, they speak volumes about the power of Shakespeare far greater than quantitative data could, though if people in the room, anyone is good at data, please let me know how you could measure these things. Um, I know I'm speaking to a room of kindred spirits and I'm a believer from way back. I was one of those kids who had Bell Shakespeare come to my school um, and I left a short career in teaching to join the company 11 years ago um, and I'm proud to work there every day, um, especially because it's a company that made education core since day one. Um, its team works on um, you know, education shows going into school halls with the same effort and care as Hamlet in the Opera House. Um, we're a theatre company. Our teachers are professional artists in their own right. We call them teaching artists. The company values were set by John Bell, a boy from Maitland who knew firsthand the value of sharing Shakespeare and live performance with audiences who didn't normally have the opportunity. The values John established remain firm today and will into the future. They're about access for all, no matter where you live or your socio-economic challenges. And I'm proud that we reach on average 80,000 kids face to face each year. And last year we reached them in 89% of federal electorates. Um, you may be aware of the companies in theatre work, or maybe the players that go into schools or some of our other education programs, but I'm hopefully going to talk to you today about things that you might not know about the company. Um, and I'm not going to talk very much about how we teach Shakespeare. If you want to go to Hugh McKinnon's workshop, which is straight after this, you can see some of those techniques, and that's being repeated on Saturday as well. Um, and I'm sure, and I'm sure most, most here are believers, there may be skeptics, skeptics in the audience, hiding, hiding away, away, and that's okay, it's my job to change, to change people's minds about Shakespeare. Shakespeare. I love a challenge. Um, but I'm not here to talk about the true believers, I'm here to talk about those who might be considered the exact opposite. Because yes, Shakespeare is hard for a lot of people and we've all got ways around that and we've heard already amazing presentations about innovative ways to teach it and we'll hear more about it over the next two days. Um, and we need this to keep ourselves and our students inspired. But what about stripping it all the way back to why bother at all? And I don't mean why Shakespeare, because I know we can all answer that question. I mean those young people in our country for whom someone could and has bluntly said, why bother? Why bother teaching them Shakespeare? Why are you teaching my kid Shakespeare? He just needs to drive a tractor. Don't bother with Shakespeare, they can barely speak English. They're five years old, don't burden them with Shakespeare yet. This won't work, you don't know my students. These kids have bigger issues to deal with right now than Shakespeare. Or from a student, I'm going to earn five times more than you working in a mine, miss. I don't need Shakespeare. These are all real things that have been said to us or to teachers that we work with. And it's absolutely fair and necessary to question what we do. And we do ask ourselves the big questions. Why do we teach Shakespeare to refugee students? Why do we go into prisons and work with young offenders? Why teach Shakespeare in Australian country towns devastated by drought, by loss of industry, unemployment, mining collapse? There are bigger fish to fry for these people. What, what right do we have to go into an Aboriginal community and teach them about this old dead white male with archaic words when their own proud storytelling culture has lasted more than 50,000 years. Rather than tell you why, I'll share stories, share the power of Shakespeare has had in the most unexpected of environments, the young people of whom others have said, why bother? And about their teachers. First, why bother? Regional remote schools. Ensuring access to programs and live theatre for regional remote schools has been and always has been a major remit for Bell Shakespeare. And one of the major ways we do this is through our work with regional teachers. And one of the programs we're most proud of is our regional teacher mentorship. I'm so excited to see a couple of regional teacher mentorship there in the front row um, here and also presenting, you know, at this conference. 
They're doing exactly what the aim is, to not have this transformation for themselves, but to share it with others. We've been running a scholarship for regional teachers since 2007, when we took 12 teachers in a year. Um, and in 2016, we expanded it to 30 teachers per year, um, who now receive a year-long mentorship. To get into the program, teachers have to apply. And what we basically ask them to do is tell us a story. Tell us about your students, tell us about your school, about your community, your unique challenges. And these challenges are not things like, my kids hate Shakespeare. They are geographic isolation, low literacy, low attendance, low socioeconomic status, low value of education, low level of parental education, parental unemployment, drought, loss of industry, difficult home lives, trauma, abuse, multiple student suicides, students with mild to severe disabilities, little or no access to resources, little or no access to PD, general lack of funding, sport prioritised over arts and English, oh, and also my kids hate Shakespeare. So Shakespeare comes in pretty low on the list of priorities and needs, and yet each year we receive applications from teachers who reach out and say, I need help. I'll never forget one letter which just opened with, help, exclamation mark. <laughs> I am the only teacher in the most remote school in Australia, and I am first year out. Didn't really need to read the rest of that letter, but I did anyway. Um, after 11 years in my job, I'm pretty good with Australian geography, but still we receive applications in, and I have no idea where this place is, and it's always fun to Google map them and see the town and zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, <laughs> zoom out, still nothing around it. I think, I don't know how I'm going to get you out of there, but I will. Um, from these applications, um, we select 30, which is hard because they are all worthy. Um, we bring them to Sydney and one of the first things we do is get them in a round table with other teachers and they share their stories that they've told to us. And you can pretty much see the light bulbs in the eyes going around when they hear their stories coming out of some other teacher's mouth from the other side of the country. Um, we share with them survey results we collected from them, keeping everyone anonymous that tell levels of confidence in teaching, knowledge of Shakespeare, who loves Shakespeare, and quite frankly, who's terrified of Shakespeare, they suddenly see that they're not really alone. We treat our mentorship teachers as students, and this is very deliberate. They need to remember what it felt like to be a student. They need, they need to, to feel, feel what a student, student will feel, feel during, during the exercise. exercise. We teach them because if they feel embarrassed and silly, guarantee, guarantee their students will too. They need to understand it's not easy to do, but have fun. Because if you don't have fun, your students won't either. We get them to play with Shakespeare. It's an intense four days of PD, exhausting in the best way possible. They then head home and implement what they've learnt in the classroom, and we're teaching colleagues at their school and other schools. And we provide support and mentoring for the rest of the year. Programs, programs where possible in their schools, schools but also they then form an online community with each other, sharing, sharing resources, wins, challenges, advice, advice and encouragement. And at the, and at the end of the program, the feedback, feedback we get from teachers is not just that they have re-inspired their love of teaching Shakespeare, it's often they have re-inspired their love of teaching. And often they admit to us that they're about ready to walk away from the classroom. I wish I could tell you about all of them, but I'll share just a few. Casey was a teacher at Lee Creek Area School in remote South Australia. Now, Lee Creek is a town built to support a mine, and that mine has since closed. The result being half the town left, and the other half of the town, remaining townspeople had no jobs. <laughs> students, students whose only, whose only career, career objective was to work in the mine were completely lost. lost. Their, parents Their parents were depressed. And in Casey's, and in Casey's classroom, she was teaching years 7 to 12. All different literacy levels, kids from a range of language backgrounds, even a selective mute. And can I honestly say, I never saw Casey without a beaming smile on her face. She adored the town and the kids. She aimed so high for them every day. We had already delivered a residency at the school before Casey turned up in Sydney for the mentorship. On arrival, she said to us, my principal has sent me here to get Bell Shakespeare back to Lee Creek. The students should not shut up about it, and it was two years ago. We've since delivered three residencies there, and each time we go, the kids don't want the teaching artists to leave, and the teaching artists don't want to leave the kids. I received an email one year from Casey saying the students had concocted a plan to kidnap the artists and keep them forever. <laughs> Another one weeks after the residency said, I just peeked through my window and watched my neighbour's kids reenact a Midsummer Night's Dream in their backyard. What did Shakespeare give these students? Chance to explore stories and characters far beyond their world an opportunity to play, to expand their thinking, their imagination and their vocab, confidence to use their voice, but most of all, Shakespeare gave them joy. 
escape, fun. And another. Alison is a teacher at Geograph Education Support Centre in Bustleton, WA. The school is for students with a very broad range of disabilities, including autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, physical disabilities, developmental delay, chromosomal disabilities and disorders, mental health disorders. Alison contacted us because she had heard about our work and would we be crazy enough to try Shakespeare with her kids. We were and we did. We've seen incredible results. Um, many times with students who live with disabilities when you use Shakespeare. Shakespeare presents something magical to them, something people think is unattainable for them, and every time they more than rise to the challenge. We kept the original language and edited it down slightly for them and they relished it, acting out Macbeth and Macduff's showdown, performing scenes and soliloquies and asking for more. Alison then came through the mentorship program and felt ready to design and teach her own program herself, which she called Shakespeare Our Way. She pitched the idea on the final day of the residency and one of the sponsors was so excited that they gave her a donation towards it on the spot. It was, and then at the end of last year, I received a video from Alison. It was a film of her students performing a 30 minute produ production in theatre of Romeo and Juliet to a warm and appreciative audience. Alison is testament to the value of belief. But it's all, not all inspiration. One year, we trained a teacher from a large regional school. Secondary, secondary school. school. The teacher had the passion, had the passion but not the school support. We didn't, we didn't realise things were that bad until she called one day and said, my principal is about to cancel Shakespeare. She said, the kids are too low literacy, we shouldn't bother anymore. What can I do, she said. We sent a teaching artist to the school for a residency uh, to implement new, active, innovative Shakespeare strategies at no cost to the school. On arrival, the principal said to our artist, well, we don't want you here. On being introduced to a class, another teacher pointed to a student and told the teaching artist, he's illiterate. I won't go through the rest of the experience, but I will tell you that the student who was supposedly illiterate did a soliloquy in front of the class at the end of the week, but the teacher didn't seem to be noticing. Unfortunately, Shakespeare has since been removed from the curriculum at that school. Last one, Clint is a teacher at Broken Hill High School. Funny story, when Clint did the regional mentorship, his high school English teacher was also doing the mentorship in the same group. But I digress. He was so inspired that he returned to his school and ran a full staff, staff meeting. meeting. All, subject All subject areas, areas involved. involved. And this is something that we always tell them. Don't just make an English drama. Get a math teachers in those high teachers everywhere. It's about active, active learning. learning. Everyone, Everyone can use it. it. They, had they had fun. fun. They, were they were silly. Um, they had a ball and Clint filmed it. Um, and, and it was um, the full just great exercise about 32 seconds. Yeah, yeah, so all the teachers in the school performing like Beth in 32 seconds. seconds. Um, and Clint filmed it with the intention of putting it on the school's Facebook page. And when he was talking to our teaching artists, he said, I really wanted to do it, but the teachers involved were too embarrassed to share it. The teaching artists didn't really have to say anything. They just looked straight back at him, saw the realisation on his face, he said, I guess that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> By the way, this is what teachers look like when they're having fun. Refugee, culturally and li linguistically diverse students, why bother? A few years ago in Juniperina Juvenile Justice Centre in Leakham, we were delivering a residency on Romeo and Juliet. One girl was fairly removed from the action. She wasn't taking part in the workshop, she was kind of just sitting on the sides. And our teaching artist, Matilda, found out the girl was not confident in speaking English and so couldn't keep up with the workshop. Matilda returned the next week with a synopsis of the play translated into Mandarin for her. The girl's eyes lit up, and from that point on, she was involved. For most English-speaking students, Shakespeare is like another language. So why teach it to students who are trying to learn English as we speak it today? Why teach Shakespeare to students who speak multiple languages and not English? That is an incredible thing about these young people. The ones who speak many languages tend to pick Shakespeare up a lot easier than their solely English-speaking counterparts. The young people we work with come from a huge range of backgrounds and some experiences that are difficult to comprehend. They are here to make a new home. There is no doubt that some of the stories and plight of Shakespeare's characters have relevance to their own experiences, but how to get that through the words on the page. We worked, we worked with Collingwood English Language, language School over three years, a school, a school for refugee and migrant students. Our teaching artist, Corrine, was a trained ESL teacher and theatre director. 
under, under her gentle, gentle support and guidance, students, students at the school went from barely speaking in a whisper to performing Shakespeare. One student from Vietnam was shy and very softly spoken. She was embarrassed and had difficulty pronouncing some of the sounds of the English language. In working with her group, she found she could be a leader through nonverbal actions, suggesting moves and kind of sculpting moments, playing the director using mime and gesture. It forced all her group to develop in their communication skills. She then began to practice key words and phrases, developing confidence in her volume and with Shakespeare's words. She performed in front of 80 people and told her teacher she would do it again. Some of the students had no previous schooling and so drama was a completely new experience for them. And one such student had always had difficulty speaking aloud in class, even answering questions. She was given the role of the prince having to stand between the two noble families and break up the fight. She was proud of what she achieved and her newfound confidence transferred into the classroom. One student who had a lot of settlement issues and was part of a community detention um, program emerged as an enthusiastic leader. They participated fully in all aspects of the program, writing stories, doing beautiful illustrations and ended up taking over the role of prop maker for the show. They didn't want the lessons to end. But Shakespeare's stories do need to be questioned, particularly in light of the cultural beliefs and life experiences of these students. And we do this in our Women in Shakespeare program, which we run in Western Sydney girls' schools. In this program, we work with a class over the course of a term. We focus on a few female characters, usually it's Juliet and Lady Macbeth. <clears throat> and the first half of the term is spent looking at these female characters within the context of their play and learning about that play. And then at the midway point, we do playwriting sessions with them. And then they spend the second half of the term rewriting the narratives. Uh, they take their character and they place them in a modern scenario that makes sense to them from their world, something that's important or of interest to them. And we give them some rules. I have to work in lines from the play. Um, they write soliloquies. And at the end of the term, they perform their plays for their peers. Some of them mirror Shakespeare's plays. Some are radical revisionings, but they are all their own their stories, inspired by Shakespeare. They take the things they like, they question the things that they're unsure of, and they push these female characters in new directions. And once again, we witness a new conversation with Shakespeare. This is from Collingwood. Blacktown Girls High. Many of you would agree that the traditional age for introducing Shakespeare is the wrong age. Teenagers tend to hate most things. So when we slug them with Shakespeare and we're starting at a disadvantage. Also a challenge is that a lot of the time they already hate Shakespeare before they begin it. Why? Because often they've been told they will hate it. By a sibling, by their parents, by someone who has a ne had a negative experience with Shakespeare. And I hate to say it to a room full of teachers, but it's people who have been taught it badly. And a lot of the work that we do at Bell Shakespeare is entering classrooms where kids are already turned off to Shakespeare and we try to turn it around and we do, but it might take an hour of a player show, it might take a two hour workshop, it might take a two week residency, but we get there. But we got thinking, how do we stop the hate in the first place? By introducing it really young. How different are these stories to any others that children's read? Wizards, witches, fairies, um, adventures on the high seas, um, magic spells, swords, blood. For children, the language is fascinating rather than confusing. What is that word, they say. If you ask for volunteers to play fairies, boys' hands shoot right up. They devour one play and want another. It's like this special thing they are granted early access to. One year on a residency at a primary school in Moree, the students would beg our teaching artists to tell them other Shakespeare stories at recess. By the end of the two weeks, the teaching artist had run through so many plot lines, he was forced to narrate Titus Andronicus with kids hanging <laughs> off every word. When we toured our production, Midsummer Madness, to primary schools, we did an adaptation for early high school too. And in this show, Puck had a few cool magic tricks. And at the end of every high school show, without doubt, second in line to a yous going out, the key question they wanted answered was, how do you do that magic trick? And then the players answered, magic. And the next question was, but seriously, how did you do that magic <laughs> trick? At the primary shows, the magic trick was never questioned. It was magic. The primary students, on average, ask far more interesting questions than their secondary counterparts, sometimes stumping the actors, though their age and experience did show when the players were often corrected that his name isn't Romeo, it's Nomeo. <laughs> and they don't die at the end. There's going to be some disappointed children in high school. 
Uh, we take workshops and special primary performances of Shakespeare into schools around the country. We commissioned Andy Griffiths to write Just Macbeth, which has been a huge hit and won awards, and we've got another collaboration with him this year, tricking kids into Shakespeare through Andy Griffiths. <laughs> we make sure we teach it in a cross-curricular approach so the teachers can tick off as many boxes as they want, makes for a musical, dramatic, poetic, artistic, sometimes scientific storytelling. But it's not been easy. When we launched the program, I had to do a day of media talking to shock jocks all over the country, basically asking me why was I torturing young Aussie kids with Shakespeare. I ended up on ABC in the evening. Let them be kids. There was an outcry. I remember, and this still happens, we call primary schools and say, hi, it's Joe from Bell Shakespeare to a receptionist say, we're a primary school and hang up. <laughs> We are now about seven years into our dedicated primary program and it has been a slow but very exciting build. There definitely are, and before we launched the program, Shakespeare champions in primary schools. But most primary teachers don't even consider Shakespeare because unlike being a secondary English teacher, you don't have to do it, so why bother? In the early years, we would be in a regional town with a gap in the players' schedule. Local primary schools were not game to book, saying their kids just wouldn't get it. It got to this stage where we'd just call a school and say, look, the actors are in town, they're not doing anything, can we just give you a free show? They obliged. And the principal would call after the show. They had never seen their students so engaged in anything. And when were we coming back? We don't change the stories or the words. We definitely don't shy away from the gruesome or dark elements. Yes, sometimes the love stuff can get a bit icky, but we found that instead of blowing kisses, you can blow bubbles at each other. And all this is fine when you're working with Dream and even Macbeth because Macbeth is a supernatural element and the baddie dies at the end, so it's okay. But what about Romeo and Juliet? Do we not teach it to kids because there's no escaping that ending? So the way we do it is we finish a Romeo and Juliet workshop sitting in a circle. All the students sit side by side as Montague Capulet, Montague Capulet. We hold hands. Um, and the students who play Romeo and Juliet place a symbolic prop from their character in the middle of the circle. And that way we can speak about the characters reflectively without having two children pretending to be dead lying down. We have incredible conversations and discussions about the play and what the students learned. Though I must highlight one student's learning um, who said, if you drink poison, you're going to die. <laughs> it's very true. And all this leads up to the day that their high school English teacher places Macbeth in front of them and rather than groan, they simply say, oh yeah, that's that guy that killed the king. Young offenders, why bother? Denmark's a prison, why then is the world one? Seeing these lines performed inside a barbed wire line walls to young offenders certainly takes on new meaning. We commenced our juvenile justice program in 2010 uh, we were granted funding by a New South Wales minister who signed the cheque and quit politics the day after. <laughs> so we lost our champion. But we had the funding to deliver the program, so we went out to the centres, who were a bit confused by it all, and we presented them with endless ideas about what we were going to do and all the plays and which plays would they want to select from because we've got ideas about how all they could work. They didn't really have much to say. Um, it was pretty clear they thought we were completely crazy. Um, the basic response was, sure, if you want to, go ahead, give it a go. First off, we were going to perform a show at Perina Centre for Girls. Preparation was interesting. I had to give the centre, a st centre staff a list of everything we were bringing in, which of course included two road cases full of props. Um, I imagine the look on the registrar's face when they received my email with one fake dagger one vial of poison, <laughs> and so on. When we arrived at the centre, we spent over an hour doing the induction, completing paperwork under a wall of contraband, hanging as a reminder that danger is ever present. Don't let your guard down. It's fair to say that by the time the actors got into the space, they were not their usual bubbly selves. Normally, they would mingle with the audience and chat to them, but this day, they were just standing behind the banners <laughs> as the kids filed in. Girls were in units were segregated by coloured T-shirts. Some were as young as 12. Guards with belts and radios standing along the perimeter near silence. The show started. It was Romeo and Juliet. The girls were watching quietly, respectfully. We wondered if they were interested at all. And then at about the halfway point, something incredible happened. Now, we all in this room know the story of Romeo and Juliet. 
It wasn't about halfway through that we realised the girls didn't. In this moment, we, uh, the girls started calling out, no, no, don't do it. They tried to warn the characters, break through that dramatic irony. They tried to tell Romeo not to take the poison. They tried to tell him that Juliet was alive. The audience was in tears, the staff were in tears, we were in tears. The actors finished the play with tears streaming down their faces. And when the show was over, there was an immediate flood of people in the space. The girls rushed up to the actors in a place filled with excitable conversation. One teacher came up to me with a young girl and she said, we've been learning about Shakespeare, haven't we? We don't let many men up on our wall of inspirational people, but we let Shakespeare get up there. Since 2010, we've worked in male and female juvenile justice centres in New South Wales and now in two Victorian centres. Last year, we started working with Akmina in Grafton, which came about via the Regional Teacher Mentorship. Two teachers from the mentorship told us about the high rate of youth incarceration in that area, and wouldn't it be awesome if we could do the program there? So they helped us make a case for funding, and we trained one of them to team teach the program. Zach, a true teacher legend, teaches the program with us in his school holidays. While the program content differs each time, we always start with a performance by the players and then a specialist class focusing um, on one play for around 15 participants, kind of over the course of a term. One centre we have a long association with is Frank Baxter um, in Carryong on the Central Coast. Teaching artists Hugh McKinnon and James Evans taught the first few years of Frank Baxter together and Hugh still teaches it today. We've delivered performances and residencies there since the inception of the program. The first time we performed Macbeth there, you could have heard a pin drop. There was no way those boys could understand every word, but they were doing, <clears throat> they were completely silent during the Shakespeare. The nature of this work is that young people are not able to be identified. We are not given any information and therefore there are no judgments. And so the plays and characters are the vehicle by which we are able to have incredible conversations about life choices and decisions consequences, analysing, debating Macbeth's moral dilemmas without the boys realising they might be talking about themselves. Being drama, playing a role, allows them to explore these choices and the decisions and questions within a safe space, offers them an opportunity to walk around in another's shoes, empathise, imagine. We can't say what that impact truly is, but what we can speak to is what we see in these boys transformations we see, seeing their confidence grow, their voices build in volume, standing taller, working together, learning lines they swore they never would be able to, conquering Shakespeare when most have very little education or schooling. It's always most apparent in the faces of the guards who see these young people every day, like the day a boy performed Is This a Dagger almost by heart. The flabbergasted guard said he'd never seen the boy even speak. The boy who asked to take a copy of the play back with him to read and heartbreakingly having to get special clearance for him for that to happen. I'd like to show a short clip about this work from a documentary that was made um, and taught by Hugh McKinnon and James Evans, and it's called Kings of Baxter. Uh, it's by Grumpy Sailors Pictures, directed by Jack Yabsley and produced by Claire Evans. Um, it's an award-winning film now, and I must say, it's testament to the age-old fact that once you bring the cameras in, everything goes pear-shaped. Um, I don't think we've had another year with that many challenges, but it's on camera now, and if you see the movie, it just shows how incredible teaching artists are. Um, I'll just show you this quickly. Hey fellas. Oh, so you guys you want? You wanna tell a story? Alright. Stand up. Tell help I'll, I'll help you out, okay? Any bits that you forget, I'll be there to help you out. Who do you want to be your Macbeth and Banquo? Go on, cuz. Come on, Ray. Go on. Go on, Ralph. Sometimes a kid will just throw your bone, you know? And Carbs was like, Do you want us to tell a story? And I was like, Yes. Macbeth um, comes in and the weird sisters come out, you know, come out of the blue and just tell his fortune and he's spinning out. They say that he's going to be king and he believes him. And Banquo was like a bit, like, you know, a bit iffy on it. 
he was a uh, great warrior before that, you know, everyone respected him and then, like he had everything he wanted, so I don't know why they wanted to be king in it. When the king announces the next person to be in line is his son, he just, he shatters and then he just, yeah, he kills, he kills the king. He doesn't really want to do it. Like his uh, wife, Lady Macbeth, persuades him. She only done it because she wanted to be queen. She wants him to be powerful, but then when it, the going gets tough, she kills herself. Oh, well, we don't know that, but I reckon she killed herself. If he never met the witches, like, she wouldn't have thought, yeah, I'm going to be queen, rah, 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 and kill this guy. She tries to rule the country and tries to own it, and he turns bad, you know? Yeah, it just goes all pear-shaped. Ross gives her... Uh, Macduff, bad news about his family getting slaughtered and his kids and his servants. He shouldn't have killed everyone and then the whole family and us. And his best friend who does that. Like he was messed up. I wouldn't do it. Kill people's families just to be king. I don't think I'm that power crazy. And once he kills one and he'll never stop. The good fellas always win so he got killed out there. Yeah. I don't think he deserves forgiveness. Yeah, I reckon it's karma. I believe in karma. You just won the war, bang, you're like this. Yeah. And you, you're, over, you're like his best. It's well worth a watch. Um, they're amazing characters, these boys in themselves. <clears throat> but we don't just work with Macbeth. Uh, one year we took a performance of Romeo and Juliet to Frank Baxter. We were unsure how the plot line would go down with the boys and whether they'd emotionally engage. Uh, with the characters, and the actor playing Juliet looked like Juliet's actual age. Um, so what would it be like for her performing in front of these young men and how would they respond to her? The performance went well. The boys were respectful. And then it came to question time and one young man put up his hand and looked directly at the actor playing Juliet and said, if my dad did that to me, I'd bash him. And a discussion followed about the moment, about the family's relationship and we had to eat our words on who we thought this audience would connect with. And now I've seen a teaching artist respond to a teacher's, but you don't know my kids, with, I've taught this in a prison, it will work. <laughs> First Nations students and communities. In a primary school in Catherine, James Evans, teaching artist and now our associate director, was running a Tempest workshop. The school was mostly attended by children from the local RAF base. James was playing Prospero, and uh, during one activity, students could approach him and ask a question. Mostly the kids asked, how long have you been on the island? How did you get here? Then one girl approached him, the only Aboriginal student in the class, and she asked him, why did you take their land? Teaching Shakespeare in First Nations communities may on paper seem, you know, quite questionable and odd, but it has and always will be for us about cultural conversations about an ancient storytelling culture and stories of a relatively new playwright coming together, about learning from one another and what these communities and young people can teach us about Shakespeare. Because no matter where we go or what play we work with, we always find new meanings. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. Every residency and program is designed in consultation with the community and its teachers. And even then, we have spent a long time planning only to arrive and have to throw everything out. I can really only skim the surface here of this work and I cannot do it justice here. I'll just tell you some snapshots. In Beswick in the NT, our teaching artist Fred Copperweight, himself an Aboriginal man, prepares to tell the story of Romeo and Juliet. He's got a group of young people in a circle standing in the red dirt. Outside of the circle stands a few aunties and elders watching inquisitively. Fred starts to allocate roles to tell the story. He casts one girl as Juliet and a boy as Romeo. He places them next to each other in the circle and they instantly shift one step away from each other. There's awkward murmurs and the kids look down. Fred wonders what he has done wrong. Eventually an elder walks over to him and says, you can't put those two together. They're of different skin. Okay, says Fred. That's exactly what this story is about. And he continues. It's just one of the many touch points that we're constantly finding with Shakespeare in these communities. In Groot Island, the players and our teaching artists arrive. They sit down in a circle and discuss with the students a question which is very important to these kids. Where are you from? The actors have brought photos of their families and talk about who is important to them, pictures of their home. Then the students talk about their families and share their stories of home. And then the teaching artist holds up a portrait of Shakespeare. 
There's a bit of a giggle. He has funny hair. And they show Shakespeare's home and they talk about who Shakespeare's family was and suddenly he's a real person too. In a residency in Maningrida, West Arnhem Land, teaching artist Rosie Pearson, who's from Yakala in Eastern Arnhem Land, brought her local knowledge to Shakespeare in a beautiful way, exchanging language with the students and making flower crowns from for Titania and Oberon from the roots of the banyan tree and pandanus leaves. In Wilcania, we sit in a school hall in a circle and tell the story of Romeo and Juliet. A girl walks in, takes a look at what we're doing and with an expletive laden expression storms right out. We continue with the workshop and we ask the kids to play roles and a familiar word is named shame, shame. We say there's no shame here, but it is very normal for these children to not want to be seen in the spotlight. We have a stash of $2 shop props and costumes with us and we find that once the kids wear a pair of silly sunglasses, they feel invisible. They'll play a role. One boy ends up with 10 pairs of sunglasses, one on top of each other, all having fun. And in walks our friend from before who decides she wants in on the action and ends up with all the costumes and all the roles for herself. In Maureen, the players are presenting Romeo and Juliet to a group of students. Abby Lee Lewis is playing Juliet. Abby is an Aboriginal woman. One young Aboriginal girl in the audience cannot take her eyes off Abby. In fact, all the other actors note that they are being completely ignored. Instead, they watch the wide-eyed and wide-smiled adoration of Abby's doting fan, who may be, for the first time, imagining that she could play Juliet. After one player's performance at a school in Queensland, the audience jumped up and performed a dance in response. And in Tennant Creek, local stories tell of Featherfoot, a fearful spirit with supernatural power. The students linked Featherfoot with Puck straight away, giving the character we view as an impish sprite a much darker motivation. In Tennant Creek, we worked with one inspirational teacher, Christy, who came through our regional teacher scholarship. Some teachers like to go big or go home, and Christy is one of them. She came through our first ever regional teacher scholarship and wanted her kids to put on Shakespeare productions, but not just the play as Shakespeare wrote it. We worked with her to develop scripts that intertwine local language with Shakespeare's words, and then we further developed them with the students in residencies, and teaching artist Matt Edgerton drove this project from our end. Students changed place names to ones from Tennant Creek and the surrounds and adapted the story as met with their life experiences. The first show was called Lunku and the Rose, based on Romeo and Juliet. It was performed on the AFL field at night, lit by floodlights, and the show opened with local policemen driving onto the field with sirens blaring to break up the Montague and Capulet brawl. The friar was played by the town poet, complete with bush medicine in place of herbs. The nurse was played by a local auntie and other members of the community were involved throughout. It was a huge success, and so more followed. We're in Cara, which was the dream, the production of The Tempest, right up until Macbeth, the hardcore remix. For the final performance, the town publican shut the pub for the night so everyone would go and watch the kids play. It had about 2,000 people watching. Yipurinya School is in Alice Springs. It's an Indigenous school that we first came to, into contact with through our mentorship. Stefan was a teacher there and wrote about his kids. He told us they came from different towns all around Alice Springs and as a result from a number of different skin groups. Conflict and prejudice between the skin groups was rife. I'm sure you're thinking what I was thinking. This is the Montagues and Capulets. We trained Stefan and planned a residency for the school using Romeo and Juliet as a focus for exploring the very real experience of these kids. But very quickly the teaching artists realised these kids weren't ready for Shakespeare. They couldn't even communicate to each other without using physical aggression. So they threw the Shakespeare out and the first year was just about basic drama skills, communication, working together slowly, slowly. Teaching artists were invited to hear about men's business. On the principal's suggestion one afternoon they got on the school bus home just so they could see where the kids lived. One lunchtime a student played I Spy with our teaching artist Ivan. I Spy with my little eye. I Spy the Australian flag. After a good look Ivan eventually gave up. It's right there, said the kid and turned around to see the Aboriginal flag in a classroom window. We never stop learning. We've delivered a residency at Yipurinya for the last six years now. In year two, they started introducing Shakespeare and by year three, the whole school performed Midsummer Night's Dream. We trained another teacher through the mentorship and teachers say the attitude of the students at the school has changed completely in all subjects. They now raise their hand in class and answer a question where before they just wouldn't do that. They play better together in the playground. They look forward to their annual visits. Attendance goes up. And we try and send the same artists building trust and a familiar face year on year for these kids. 
and we keep learning about Shakespeare through them. That's your Perinia, that's Abby holding the lunches. Beswick, that's Tennant Creek, Matt working with them. And that was Marcellus, one of the students at Tennant who performed um, Romeo in Lunku and the Rose and ended up directing his fellow students. And that's the show. Thinking back to the school that cancelled Shakespeare, I wish that when that call came in, I had a document to send that teacher, something that would prove the value of Shakespeare, something that said, don't you dare give up. We need a manifesto for teaching Shakespeare so there will be no excuses. No, why bothers? No, this won't work. No, you don't know my kids. We know it works and here's the proof. A document that will help teachers who are scared, a document that will help the teachers who are passionate but giving up the fight. So we've started working with um, the wonderful David McInnes at the University of Melbourne on a manifesto for the teaching of Shakespeare in Australia, written for Australian teachers and students, filled with stories and case studies, as well as the hard data to support the fact that we can no longer make a case for why bother. We want to create a document endorsed by theatres, universities, schools, actors, teachers, communities, people who say this works especially those who will say, I didn't think it would work, but it does. Because these stories I've told here today are a fraction of the ones you all know, so I hope that we can band together as a community and create this together. So let's have that conversation. Now the final story. Comes from Frank Baxter. It was about two years ago we were planning the next visit to the centre. We'd been there for many years now, exploring Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet. We thought it was ready to, time to step up at Onch. We decided these boys were ready for Hamlet. And Hugh McKinnon was, let's just say, thrilled that we, all be, we were telling him he had to deliver it. As we all know, Hamlet is about big ideas, big dilemmas, the biggest ones humans can face. Let alone the sheer wealth, wealth, wealth and depth and length of the play, Hamlet is a challenge due to its content. It's bleak. It ponders deep, dark questions about life, death, our very existence. What value would it be to young men behind bars? You heard earlier the reason why we chose Macbeth to work with these young men thematically. The bonus is that Macbeth has plenty of stuff going on as well, lots of action to play. So it was a couple of weeks into Hamlet at Baxter that Hugh realised nothing much happens in Hamlet. He needed a new approach. He knew that many of these boys probably had thought about the big things that Hamlet thinks about. They may have asked those big questions of themselves and considered some very dark things. And here they were for reasons that we didn't and weren't allowed to know. Because we don't know, we don't judge. Minds are kept open. These young men are not treated as their offence. This meant that it was very hard to discuss anything personal, especially as we knew that, they, that many of them felt shame about what they'd done. It was hard to even consider a personal conversation. Hugh gave them to be or not to be. They looked at the first four lines of the speech and they discussed what Hamlet was saying, the choices laid out for him. And Hugh told them he believed that everybody has, at some point in their lives, made the decision to be. If you made the decision, if you made the decision not to be, you wouldn't be here. That was all that was said. There was never any explicit conversation. The young men were given a piece of paper and a pencil. They were instructed to write down to be, then next to that, for, and then they wrote down a reason. Hugh and his fellow teaching artists wrote theirs down too, and so did the Frank Baxter staff in the room. And when they were all finished, Hugh invited them to share what they'd written, if they wanted to, and they did. So on the final day of the residency, it was time for a performance. Scenes and soliloquies from Hamlet were presented as our teaching artists narrated the story. It was performed for the whole centre community, detainees, staff, guards, and visiting families of the boys. And at the end of the performance, one of the boys stood up and delivered the most natural performance I've ever seen of To Be or Not To Be. And I honestly think this was because he had no idea he was saying the greatest speech ever written. He just said it. And at the end of the performance, um, he turned around to the line of boys and stuff sitting on chairs and he pointed to each one and he said, To Be. Then each replied, To Be for my mum. To Be for my family. To Be for my baby daughter to be to make a better life. Needless to say, once again, we're in tears and Hamlet had new meaning all over again. 
Transformations are in students and their teachers, in students experiencing Shakespeare for the first time and those teachers teaching Shakespeare for 30 years. Shakespeare is just the vehicle for transformative learning. Yes, some of us love it, but the point is not the appreciation. That's a bonus. It's about how Shakespeare can connect us and raise us up. For some of these young people, they may not remember the specifics of Shakespeare, but they will remember that they conquered it, that they could do it something that adults told them they couldn't do. Some of them will take these stories with them in their hearts for the rest of their lives and join our kindred spirits, and that's great. But not all of them will. It's about new narratives, surprising narratives, cultural connections, to learn what we don't know and never stop learning. But mostly it's about expectations, setting them high, because there is something about Shakespeare that makes us rise up. It makes young people smash through the don't bother and in these situations, it rings absolutely true that we know not what we are, but know not what we may be. Thank you.